and he's good. Kiddos, ages four through second grade, you guys can go ahead and be dismissed. Right out the door to the right is our children's church. Parents, you can pick them up just around the corner um, by where you got your donuts this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts is in the New Testament towards the end of your Bible, right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the reason Easter Sunday is so, I don't know, exhilarating maybe, um, the reason it's so impactful, the reason it's so joyous is because of the low of Friday. Friday, when Christ is crucified, betrayed by Judas, beaten, mocked, spit on, whipped, and then nailed to a cross till he was dead. Good Friday is the lowest of low for the church. The disciples in despair went and hid, locked themselves in a room, afraid of if they will kill our leader, what will they do to us? And notice who goes to the tomb on Easter morning. It wasn't the 12, it was a group of ladies who went to put spices on his body because they couldn't do it on the Sabbath. And lo and behold, the angel says, he's not here, he's risen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? And all chaos broke out. You know, it's kind of like this. When, we were, when I was at UNI, we took a, a teaching class on, um, I don't remember exactly what it was, some philosophy or, I don't know, something about how people think or something like that. I don't really remember. I wasn't really paying attention. But <laughs> there, was, there was an assignment. So at UNI, like when you park illegally, you get this little yellow envelope. Some of you maybe have gotten one or ten of those. And inside it is your parking ticket. And our teacher was explaining how the biggest difference for people is from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs. And so he's like, I had this challenge for you. Like, go and, and put a yellow note on someone's car and see how they react when they get it. But inside the note, have something positive for them to read. Well, we took this and did the assignment, but we took it back to our navigator ministry and we're like, you know what, let's do this, but with like the gospel and maybe like a little, you know, gift card in there. And so we did this and we sat back and I remember a couple of my friends and I, like we were in the parking lot around the quad and we had put in like 40 of these things and we watched people come out and they're like furious, like absolutely irate. Like, are you kidding me? I am in the lines. I have my ticket. I have my, my parking pass. And then they pull it out and they open it up and it's like a gift card to whatever, Chick-fil-A or whatever it was. I don't remember. And they, they go from like the angriest, meanest, most saddest person on the planet to like the most elated person on the planet. And that's the idea from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. You go from this lowest of lows where, man, nothing is going right. Everything is against me. The darkness is creeping in. Everything is against me, and I am losing this fight to Sunday morning where, man, Jesus shows his victory, and not even death and the grave could defeat him. And that's where we find ourselves here in Acts chapter 2. This is the very first sermon ever preached after the resurrection. Beginning in verse 22, Peter says this, Acts 2, 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death 
because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, speak to us this morning May your Holy Spirit illuminate in our hearts the truth of your word, the truth of the gospel, the, the positive element. God, that even though we are sinners, even though we cannot measure up to your standard of perfection, God, Jesus did it for us. And God, let our hearts cry out to you in praise and adoration for all that you have done for us. And remind us this morning that death does not win. The grave did not conquer. Because Jesus has risen, he is alive forever. And we will join him in that resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Easter morning, a, it's a beautiful reminder of God's love for us. Resurrection Sunday teaches us that God has done what we never could have. We never could. The empty tomb is tangible proof that God is pleased with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. It satiated his wrath. It purchased a people for his own possession, a people completely forgiven and restored to fellowship and relationship with him. It's the climax of the gospel which began clear back in the Garden of Eden when sin entered into the world, when mankind chose to rebel against God and to sin and eat the fruit that God said, do not eat from this tree. But here's the fact of the matter. The gospel is offensive. The Easter message is inflammatory by nature because it is the grace of God. You see, the prerequisite for grace is need. It's incredibly offensive because it implies that you and I are not right. We are not enough. We are not good. Not good enough, not loving enough, not righteous enough, not holy enough. The gospel is offensive because the grace of God implies that I am in need of being saved because I am lost in my sin, but I don't have what it takes to save myself. In fact, the gospel says you cannot save yourself. Your good deeds are not enough. And that crushes our independence. You see, in order to get the, get the grace of God, you have to get broken. You have to see your own sin, and you have to realize that you are dead 
incapable of saving yourself. You are on the gurney. You have bled out. You are not alive. You need someone else to grab the paddles and restart your heart for you. And until you recognize that you are dead, you will not desire a Savior who offers life to you. And if the gospel has not broken you yet, I pray that it does this morning. Because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And the gospel says that Jesus went to the grave because of you and for you. You see, it's our sin that required the cross in the first place. The gospel says that you are irreparably sinful. You could not manage your sex habit. You could not stop lying. You couldn't turn your anger into joy. You couldn't treat your wife or your husband well. You could not live up to his law. Your self-centered behaviors continue to control you. Your greed and your desire for more and more and more could not be assuaged. You tried, but you failed. And the gospel says the more you try to fix things, the worse they continue to get. You couldn't love anything but yourself. You couldn't change, nor did you really want to. Gospel says you're not a victim, but in fact, you loved your sin cancer, the very thing that was killing you from the inside out. You were so lost, so blind, so dead, but then grace entered in. God loved you anyway. He stepped into your darkness. He stepped into your mess and your muck and your garbage and took your sins upon himself on the cross. He took your place as, his substitu- as your substitute. The gospel says that Jesus went to the grave because of you, because of your sin, because of your brokenness. The gospel says you, you are the problem, not this world not your neighbors, not your kids, not your spouse, not your boss. You are the problem. It's not what you do that's the problem. It's not where you have been placed that's the problem. It's who you are, a sinner. That's why you're stuck. That's why you can't fix your situation. We're cursed with sin. And before I am willing to accept the grace of God, I must see that to be true of me. I have to recognize that it is my sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. I have to recognize that I am the problem. You see, if mankind wasn't sinful, Jesus wouldn't have had to suffer and die. It's my fault I've used this analogy before, but it's like you're, you're swimming at the beach, which sounds amazing after a long winter. You're swimming at the beach, and you're having a good old time out there in the water, and all of a sudden, lifeguard comes racing down the beach, sprinting as fast as he possibly can, grabs you around the neck, and drags you up onto the beach, and starts pumping on your chest. You're going to be pretty upset. How dare you mess up my holiday at the beach? What are you doing? However, if you're swimming at that same beach and all of a sudden you start sucking in water and your leg starts cramping up because you just got old and you don't, can't move very well anymore. Not that I know what that's like. And you start drowning and you can't keep your head above water and you you're just keep breathing in water. And now that same lifeguard sprints down there and drags you up from the bottom of the water and brings you up on the shore and starts pounding on your chest and breathing in your mouth. And you finally spit out all that ocean water. Man, that guy is no longer a mean old lifeguard. That's your savior. If you don't recognize your drowning, you don't recognize your need to be saved. But here's the fact of the matter. Jesus did it for you. Jesus went to the grave for you. 
His love for you is the reason that he went. Now, my sin nailed him to the cross. But it was his love for me that motivated him to come in the first place and put on flesh and humble himself. It was his love for me that even though in the Garden of Gethsemane he was sweating blood because of the extreme psychological stress, because he knew exactly what was coming his way Good Friday night. He knew exactly what was coming. And yet he says, not my will, but your will be done, Father. His love is what motivated him to suffer and to die for me and for you. Because he loves you more than you ever could have dreamed. More than you ever would have even dared to hope. You are more loved than you ever imagined. That's what the cross shows. That's what the empty tomb displays. That's what the gospel declares with shouts of joy and adoration. You are loved by God more than you ever imagined. The God of the universe who formed you and knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows you better than you know yourself. He sees you. He truly, truly sees you. All of you. He sees your brokenness. He sees your depravity. He sees your sin-stained heart that continues to chase after things that we know we shouldn't be chasing after because they don't satisfy. It just leaves us wanting more and more and more. He hears your inner thoughts that you don't want anyone in the world to know you're thinking about. He knows you. And the gospel says he loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. He loves you even though you're not worthy of his love. Even though you don't love him the way you should, he still loves you. And that's why he went to the grave for you. And this morning, if you hear nothing else, hear this. See him. Look at the Savior who went to the grave for you to show you how much he truly loves you. Behold him. Look at him. See him in all of his radiant glory. Behold him, the, the perfect, spotless lamb who lays down his life so that you could be forgiven. Look to him and live. If you will confess your utter brokenness, if you will admit your total blindness, if you will repent and come to Jesus as your only hope, the gospel says you will live. That's the message of God's word. That's what Jesus came to accomplish and to purchase with his own blood. True life is found only in Jesus Christ. The things of this world... They're not going to satisfy you. The things you continue to chase after, they're going to let you down. None of them are fully pleasing. None of them will save you from yourself. But here's the fact of the matter is Jesus has already done everything necessary, everything needed to save you. There's no one too lost that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse and the empty tomb has already declared that Jesus has already won past tense, not future tense. He is risen. Your redemption is finished. The work is complete. There's nothing left for you or me to do. Coming to church does not gain you access to the Father. Reading your Bible does not gain you entrance into the kingdom. It's seeing and beholding and coming to the Savior that gains you access. Jesus did it all because he knew you couldn't do it in, on your own anyway. So he did what we never could. 
And the gospel is offensive because it says that you can't. And if you're stubborn like me, competitive, that grates at who I think I am, how dare you say I can't? Let me show you I can. And many of us, myself included, I have tried, worked my fingers to the bone as the song goes, trying to prove that I can be good enough. And in the end, continues to remind myself, no, you can't. Stop trying to do it on your own. Jesus already did it all. And the only reason that the gospel is such good news is because the grave didn't win. Death wasn't victorious. The resurrection is proof that Jesus' death as our substitutionary atonement, the one who stood in our place to take our punishment from God, fully satisfied God's wrath. He drank every last drop. All of it. There's nothing left. There's nothing left for you to atone for if you are in Christ. There's no punishment after this life if you are in Christ. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The guilty verdict is already erased. And God bangs that gavel and says, you are not guilty because Jesus already paid the penalty. You can go free. The curse of sin was fully absorbed on the cross. The price of your forgiveness has already fully been paid. The resurrection was the immeasurable greatness of the power of God on full display for the world to see. The grave could not hold him. Death no longer has dominion over him. In Peter's sermon here in Acts 2, verse 24, he proclaims this. God raised him up from the dead, loosing the pangs of death. Because look at what he says, end of 24. It was not possible for Jesus to be held by death's grip. It was impossible. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. It was impossible for Jesus to be held captive by death's power because he is the true king, the promised son of David who will rule from David's throne for all of eternity. He is the holy one of God who the Father will not let see corruption, will not let see decay. He was not abandoned to the grave. He was raised up by the awesome power of God. And Jesus now reigns eternally as king over death. Death no longer has dominion over him. Jesus has dominion over death. And for those of you who are in Christ, that is the greatest news of all time. Because the greatest curse of all time came when sin entered the world and God said, now death comes with it. Our sin earns death. But now Jesus says, death doesn't get the last word, I do. And Jesus makes a claim in John chapter 11, verse 21, right before he raises Lazarus from the dead. If you remember the story, Lazarus got sick. Mary and Martha, followers of Jesus, they, they send for Jesus, say, hey, Jesus, come save, come heal our brother. Lazarus ends up dying before Jesus comes. Four days has passed. Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. And Jesus comes to Bethany. And Martha says this to him in verse 21, John eleven twenty one. 21. Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know that you could have healed him. I know what you can do, Jesus. But listen what Jesus says. He tells her, your brother will rise again. And Martha, she's been listening to Jesus, probably better than most of the disciples. Martha says to him in verse 24, Jesus, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. 
She understands the end times. She gets that there's a resurrection and all of those in Christ will be raised to victory when Jesus comes back at the end. She gets it. She gets the resurrection. But Jesus throws her a curveball. Verse 25, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Not I can resurrect people. I am the resurrection. I am. Our hope is not in an event, church. Our hope is in a person. Nothing can stop him from giving life because he doesn't have life. He is life. He is life. You have life. And your life can be taken from you. Jesus is life. He cannot and will not lose his life. He lays it down. His resurrection is proof that death could not take life from him. He is God in the flesh. He is the author of life. He is the one who breathed life into creation. Everything exists for him and because of him. Life exists because Jesus made it too. Because Jesus is life, no grave ever stood a chance against him. Death stood no chance. Jesus fought death and Jesus got the last word. Now think of this though. Up until Easter Sunday, death was 100% effective. Death had never lost. He was undefeated. And all of a sudden, Jesus steps into the ring and death is no longer undefeated. Death had always won. The wages of sin is death, and so all men sin, and so all men die. Death passed to all men because sin passed to all men. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Death had always won because every man is sinful. But here's the kicker, Jesus was not sinful. He was perfect, completely without sin, impeccably holy, spotless and without blemish. You see, the sin that he bore on the cross wasn't his own. It was ours. And his sacrifice pleased the Father. And so the Father raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And the Father is putting all things under his feet And gave him as head over all things to the church, Ephesians 1. He's victorious. The grave could not hold him because he is the resurrection and he is the life. And here's what that means for you. The empty tomb, why does it matter? Why is the empty tomb one of those points that atheists And agnostics and unbelievers continually want to try to undermine and explain away. Well, here's why. Because the empty tomb is the pinnacle element of whether or not the gospel is true or not. If Jesus is still dead, then you are still in your sins. But if Jesus has risen from the dead, then the gospel and his message is true. And there's all kinds of ways that that unbelievers have tried to, to explain away the empty tomb. Maybe, maybe Jesus just passed out on the cross and, and then he woke up once he got into the cool of the, of the tomb. Well, if you know anything about crucifixion, if you know anything about medical things, I don't know the word, you know that that's impossible. The best executioners ever were the Romans. They figured out more heinous ways to kill people than anyone else. They were experts at executing people on the cross. 
And in fact, if the Roman soldiers had done a crucifixion and their prisoner had gotten off and lived, then they would have been executed. They were perfect at it. And in fact, historians have said that in all of Roman history, one person got off the cross alive. And he died within 20 hours afterwards. Every single person who was crucified died. And that's not even including the flogging that Jesus took beforehand. To the point where his flesh was ripped from his bones and he would have been in hypovolemic shock from the loss of blood from the flogging before he was ever nailed to the cross. The swoon theory is an absolute joke of an excuse for an empty tomb. The other thoughts are like, well, maybe the disciples were just really stupid and they went to the wrong tomb. They were common, uneducated men, fishermen, blue-collar dudes. But the chief priests and the Pharisees knew where he was buried. The Romans knew where he was put. They wouldn't have been confused. So that one falls short too. Maybe the disciples stole the body. Maybe that's what happened. Like they, were, they just went and they knew Jesus was supposed to rise. So to, to prove this hoax, they went and grabbed the body and hid it somewhere. Well, I don't know if you know the Watergate story. They tried to lie and cover up the tapes. But once the rubber met the road and the judgment started coming down and the punishment started to be doled out, those men turned over and flipped as fast as they possibly could because they knew what they were saying was a lie. All 11 of the original disciples, Judas already executed himself. The other 11 all died or were brutally tortured and never recanted their stories. Jesus showed himself to over 500 people at one time after his resurrection. Could you imagine bringing a dead corpse and trying to convince people that he's alive? Would not have won over anyone. No, the fact of the matter is Jesus rose from the dead. And you can even see here in Peter's first sermon, he says, you men of Israel, you guys were here. You saw what he did. You know that he died. He doesn't even mince any words. You saw him crucified and you killed him. There's no doubt in the minds of these early people that Jesus was killed and that he rose from the dead. The question was, how do you explain it? The grave could not hold him because he is the resurrection. And what that means is the empty tomb proves that he was who he said he was and he did what he said he would do. He has risen, he is alive, and what it does is it assures our future resurrection. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul proclaims that through the resurrection of Jesus, God has made us, the church, those who follow Jesus, those who come to him in faith, he has made us alive together with Christ and has seated us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Our very salvation is an outworking of Jesus' resurrection we are the result of Jesus raising from the dead, you and me, the life that is now in you that wasn't there before. Our salvation is an outworking of Jesus' resurrection. You and me, men and women who were once dead in our sins, alienated from the fellowship of God, destined for condemnation and separated from the righteousness of God, have now been made alive, born again to a new life, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Your new life is proof that the resurrection was legit and true. 
We now walk in newness of life in the very same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. That same exact power is working and inside of you through the Holy Spirit. And in the very next verse, in Romans chapter 6, verse 5, he says this. Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united with Jesus in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin, my flesh, might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now listen to his point. So if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. What Paul's saying in Romans is because Jesus died, we who are united with him die with him. But because Jesus lives, you who are united to Jesus are also raised with him. Because Jesus lives, we live. Because he rose, we too will rise. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The Christian life is one that has been crucified with Christ. Jesus calls you to lay down your life for him. Come to me. Leave all. Die to self. Flee from sinful passions and live for him. To let him live through us. The message of the gospel is this, come and die. Come and die and find that in Christ you will truly live. You will find true life, an abundant life. A life that blows this worldly life completely out of the water. It's the abundant life that we've all been seeking after. We've just been looking in the wrong places for it. It isn't found in the party scene. It isn't found in money or or in riches. It isn't found in fame or success. You won't gain it through trophies. You can't find it in a spouse or in children or in work or in play. You can't earn it through charities or good deeds or going to church or having a moral life. You can't gain it by affecting change in the world around you. It's only found in the resurrected life that Jesus purchased for you through the resurrection on Easter Sunday. That's where your hope lies. Anything else will let you down. That's where you find meaning for your life. That's the only place you will find purpose. That's the only place you will find joy that overwhelms your heart and love that covers your fears and your insecurities. You have to look to Jesus. Look at his face. See his glory of God. See his love displayed on the cross. See his radiant majesty in his resurrected body and know that if you come to him in faith, believing that God raised him from the dead and repenting of all of your self-exalting lifestyle, Jesus promises you will be forgiven. You can be set free from the chains of sin that have held you captive. Jesus offers you a new life, a life of satisfaction and joy and fellowship with him, all purchased through his blood that paved the way. See, when you submit yourself to Jesus, when you lay down your life in repentance, trusting in the blood of Jesus and only the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and your redemption purchased by his death, then just like Jesus, death loses its grip on you. No grave can keep you from rising with him. In Revelation 1 17 and 18, Jesus says, do not be afraid. He's talking to John here. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades, meaning the grave. Jesus says, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be scared of. 
I entered the tomb. I entered the grave. I took the keys. And now I can unlock the door of death from the inside. Jesus has the power. Death no longer has any sting. Death has lost its fear factor. The fear of death is what enslaves people. It holds us captive. It makes us timid. It makes us dull. It makes us run after things that we think will preserve our life and help us to live longer days. Nobody really likes kale chips. We'll do whatever it takes to try to give us one more day on this earth because the fear of death is terrifying. It holds us captive. It chains us to do dumb things, to live safe, bubble-wrapped lives, afraid to do anything of eternal value afraid to live boldly and freely in God's love. But church, hear this. If you are united to Jesus Christ, then you do not have to fear the grave. It is only temporary. There is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. If you have that inkling of fear in the back of your mind of, man, what am I going to do when I have to face God? And all of my deeds are laid out in the book of life before him. And he goes through and he sees all of my thoughts and all of my words and all of my actions. They're repulsive. If you have any inkling of fear, then you do not understand the gospel or you have not come to Christ in the first place. Because in the gospel, Jesus takes all of those wicked and sick and evil and sinful actions and words and thoughts to the cross. For those in Christ, there is no longer any condemnation. There is nothing held against you, never to be brought up again, which means there is no longer any fear in death because Jesus has purchased our resurrection. Instead, we know that our death brings us face to face with the Savior, wrapped in his eternally loving arms. You see, church, if sin is paid for and righteousness is provided to you and justice is satisfied, then nothing can keep Jesus or his people in the grave. Victory is assured. Jesus has already won and we will be victorious with him. If you don't know that gospel, I would encourage you not to walk out those doors this morning. Come find me, come find Dennis or Stephen, come find our elders, come find someone that brought you here and get right with the Lord because we are not guaranteed tomorrow and we don't know what tomorrow holds. And I get it. I remember being in that place I grew up in the church hearing messages and sermons and not really understanding the gospel. And when I heard the gospel for the first time, it was offensive to me. Who do you think you are telling me that I can't earn my way to heaven? Who do you think you are saying I'm not good enough? I'm not the one saying it. God is. But once I finally came to the Savior and said, you're right, I can't do this. I'm fighting this fight that I cannot win. I'm, I'm trying to do things that I am not capable of achieving on my own. And I see my sinfulness and I know that I'm in deep trouble when I stand before the Savior. And you fall on your face before the cross. And you say, Jesus, it's, if you're going to save me, it's got to be in your gospel. It's got to be through your grace, unearned favor. And he says, I love you. I already proved it on the cross. There's no sinner too lost that Jesus, for Jesus to save. The gospel is offensive. 
It says, there is only one hope for me, that the infinite wisdom of God might make a way for the love of God to satisfy the wrath of God so that I might become a child of God through the sacrificial death of the Son of God only because of the grace of God. Amen. And that's exactly what Jesus did. It's exactly what the resurrection proves. It's exactly what the empty tomb shows. And that's what we celebrate this morning, that no grave could hold him, which means that no grave can keep you from rising with him because he is risen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are not worthy. I am not worthy of your grace. I am not worthy of your mercy that you poured out for me through your blood. But man, I am grateful for it. God, I pray this morning that if there are those here who have not yet fallen to their knees before the Savior, Lord, that you would not let them sleep, that you would continue to work on their hearts, that you would continue to stir in them and regenerate their hearts through the good news of the gospel. God, help us to praise you, to celebrate you, to shout from the mountaintops that our God lives, and because you live, God, we too can live. Do not let us be quiet about the good news of what you've done for us, but cause us to go and to spend and be spent for your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> glorious day. It's going to be a glorious day when he comes back. If you know Jesus, if not, it's going to be a terrifying day. But he says, I'm coming back. I'm going for a while. I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'll be back like good old Arnold. This Jesus who was crucified by the hands of lawless men, God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The men and women of Israel heard this sermon and it caught them to the heart. And they're like, okay, Peter, wh what do we do? What are we supposed to do? And here's what Peter says. Brothers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for those who are your children, and for those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The door is open. The invitation is before you. The question you have to ask yourself is, what am I going to do with the empty tomb? What am I going to do with this Jesus who claims to be God and says, I died for you and rose again? Call him lunatic, call him a liar, or call him Lord. If you don't call him Lord, I'd like to talk to you. And if you do call him Lord, man, go, don't be quiet. Don't go, you know, eat the ham and mashed potatoes and, you know, cheesy, cheesy hash browns. Go oh, tell people, tell people about the good news because, man, it is amazing news and our world needs it. Go church, go and be blessed.